Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. For those who are visiting with us, let me just say that what we normally do is we study our way through books of the Bible or through sections of Scripture, large sections of Scripture. Recently we've been in the book of James talking about trials in the first chapter and taken, taken a large section there that we've studied our way through. But from time to time when there's a particular subject that I want to deal with, we will do what is commonly referred to as a topical sermon. We don't do that often, very, very rarely, uh, because I don't believe it's the best way to handle God's Word as a, as a rule, as a matter of common practice. But this morning and this evening, we're going to do that, because there's a particular subject that I want us to deal with. And so the first passage I want us to read is found here in Ephesians 4. We begin with verse 25. We're going to read down to verse 32. The Word of God says this, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Let's go to our God together in prayer and ask His blessing on His word this morning. Father in heaven, our almighty God, we ask that you would bless now this time of preaching. Lead us and guide us in a way that your truth will be proclaimed clearly and faithfully, and that your word will be received well in our hearts, that we will be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, and receive with meekness the implanted word of God. May the result of that be, Lord, much good fruit. I pray this for your church. And I pray for the lost in this room and those who hear my voice, that, Lord, in your great mercy, they would see their desperate need for your Son, the brevity of this life, the certainty of death in this world until Jesus comes, and, Lord, their absolute desperate need for Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, for a right standing before you. We ask, Lord, that you would grant this mercy. We'll thank you for what you accomplish in this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. We see it on the news virtually these days, every day. It's an issue that has been grossly politicized. There are laws in our nation that have been formed to address it. There are countless people trying to empower themselves and enrich themselves at the expense of it. What is on display in our world, in the lives of many, many people, is a very deep and a very ugly racial divide. And as Christians, we can't ignore it. Everything we see in our world calls upon us to think. Everything we encounter in our world requires us to form judgments. We're forced to form conclusions. 
And as with everything else we encounter, we have to ask the question, uh, when we come in contact with racial prejudice, racial division, whether it's on a personal level or locally or nationally, I've got to ask the question, does my thinking agree with God? When I see the news report, when I hear the radio commentary, when there's conversation about it amongst my friends or maybe in your family, and not just your immediate family, maybe your extended family, the question has to be asked, do our thoughts agree with Scripture on this subject? If we're Christians, we are to put sin to death in all of its forms. As believers, we are putting sin to death in all of its forms. That includes the sinful ways that we think about other people. If we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that includes the subject of how we think about other people. We can't skip that subject. All forms of sinful thinking, all forms of sinful attitudes, all forms of bitterness, all forms of pride, all forms of anger and resentment, all forms of hatred, all forms of malice must be given no room to survive in our lives. We'd be putting sin to death in all of its forms. That includes in the way that we think, in the way that we feel, in the way that we speak, in the way that we deal with other people. It's what we saw right here in verse 31, isn't it? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And don't underestimate those words, you know, the little word all. All bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, all slander, all malice. It's to be put away. That includes the sin of racial prejudice. Today, this morning and this evening, this is what I want us to think about together, racial prejudice and the Christian. Racial prejudice and the Christian. How are we as Christians to think about this deep and ugly racial divide that it exists in our world? Let me just in advance tell you how we're going to handle this subject today. Um, I don't, I'm not attempting to handle this subject exhaustively because it would take a lot longer than two sermons. What I want to do is, is bring selectively into the picture some texts of Scripture that are representative of other texts of Scripture that will then shed light in our minds, in our hearts, for how we ought to think through this issue. I want us to think through this subject from the standpoint of Scripture. If we know the living God, if we believe Him, if we believe His Word, how are we to think about the subject of racial prejudice? So it's not an exhaustive attempt. It's just a selective one, but a representative one. That's how we're going to do it. And I want to begin this morning by asking three questions that will set the stage for what we're going to learn. And then what we're going to do is we're going to think through the subject based upon three doctrines. We're going to organize these scripture texts under three main headings. We're going to, we're going to think about racial prejudice from the standpoint of the doctrine of creation, from the standpoint of the doctrine of the new creation, and from the standpoint of the doctrine of sin. And when I talk about the, doc the doctrine of sin, I'm going to center in on one particular aspect of it, what the Bible has to say about sinful distinctions. So the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of new creation, the doctrine of sin. And then after we've asked the questions and we've looked at answers under those three headings, this will be tonight, we're going to you know, bring it down on, on ground level we're going to ask some really hard questions from a very practical point of view, and we're going to take some practical steps together to make sure that, that no vestiges of this sinful way of thinking about people can exist in our lives. We're called to put to death sinful thinking about people where we are conscious of it, 
but we're also called to say to our God, Lord, wherever there are sinful ways of thinking about people in my life that I'm unconscious of, would you show it to me? And then wherever our God makes conscious to us what was before unconscious, we have to consciously put that to death also. And so we want to take some some steps that will make sure that all forms of this sinful way of thinking about people, all forms are put away from us. All bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, all slander, all malice, put it all away. So that's our plan for the day. Three questions to set the stage. Here's the first one. What is racial prejudice? And I'll say up front as we begin, we're, we're thinking now outside of biblical categories. All we're trying to do at this point is get our arms around a cultural issue. We're trying to recognize what is out there in our world. So personally, I don't even like to speak in the terms of race, but you're going to hear that word. You're going to read that word. People are going to discuss this issue using those kinds of words. And so we want to get our arms around the issue from a cultural point of view. What is racial prejudice? Because when we get our arms around it, then we're going to do something with it. What is it? And it's defined in more than one way. You know, there are other terms you hear, racism, racial bigotry. So taking that word, for example, racism, what is racism? Some people like to define racism in terms of a belief system. Some people like to define racism in terms of activity. An example of a definition that emphasizes a belief system is one that was provided by the Presbyterian Church in America in the year 2004. Here is the definition they offered. Racism is an explicit or implicit. Let me just stop there. So either something you make clear or something you hold privately or something you imply. Racism is an explicit or implicit belief or practice that qualitatively distinguishes or values one race over other races. By the way, just a quick step back. When you talk about race, you're talking about a category that culture has created, society has created whereby they, they identify a group of people who share common biological traits. So skin color, hair texture, things of that nature. So biological traits shared by a group of people that are put into a category by society. Race. We talk about ethnicity, now you're talking about culture. And, of course, these things often overlap, but you're talking about belief systems and ways of doing things that characterize a particular class of people. Racism is when you take one race and you exalt it over other races, explicitly or implicitly. For those who would define racism in terms of action, here's an example of, of this. This is from Webster's. Poor treatment of or violence against people because of their race. So you treat someone poorly or aggressively. I mean, you're violent against them because of their racial identity. And if you define racism in terms terms of action, then prejudice would be the attitude that stands behind the action. Racism would be the action. It's prejudice in action. Prejudice would be defined this way, preconceived judgment or opinion. An adverse opinion or leaning formed without just grounds or before sufficient knowledge. So let me take all these definitions and try to make it simple. Let's just make it this simple. Here's what you do if you're guilty of a sinful way of thinking about racial issues. You classify people based upon their race or ethnicity, you classify them, then you characterize them, then you relate to them based upon that classification and characterization. So instead of thinking that people are people are people are people, and each person is to be related to individually, what I do is I classify a group of people based upon 
shared biological traits or based upon their culture. I classify a group of people and then I characterize that entire group of people. So I have preformed opinions about this class of people, this group of people. And then I relate to them based upon these classifications and characterizations. And I hope to demonstrate by the time we're done today from God's Word that all such thinking is sinful and must be rejected by Christians. Dear ones, we can't think that way. Second question, who is capable of racial prejudice? Who's capable of it? The answer is everyone. Everyone. See, as Christians, here's what we've got to be convinced of. And I, and I would just ask you, are you convinced of this? We talk about racism, racial bigotry, racial prejudice. We're not talking about a skin issue. We're talking about a sin issue. This is a sin issue. And it's not a sin that is confined to any one color of skin. In this world today, lines of loyalty, lines of animosity are being drawn by people of every color of skin based upon color of skin. And those lines represent a sinful, fallen way of thinking. So as Christians, we have to reject the lines. We don't, we don't draw lines of loyalty based upon skin color. We don't draw lines of animosity based upon skin color. That, that's sinful, fallen thinking. And I ask this question and I answer it for this reason. Here's what this means. Everyone listening to my voice this morning, everyone listening to my voice needs to examine himself or herself as a follower of Jesus Christ if you claim to be a follower of Christ and you've got to be willing to put to death any kind of thinking in you that doesn't align with Scripture. So you can't, you can't look at the person who has a different skin color than you and say, that's where racism resides. No, you've got to draw a circle around your own life. Everyone in this room and ask, is there thinking in me about other people, God, that doesn't agree with your word? And wherever it exists, I've got to put that to death in my life. So what is it? We categorize people. We characterize people. We relate to people based upon the categories. Who's capable of it? Everyone. Because it's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. Third question, how is the church to be different than the world when it comes to this issue? Well, that's what we're going to be learning about in these two sermons, but I, I just want to state it in general terms at the start. The church is different from the world, we can put it this, this simply, because the church is in the light. The church is in the light. The church sees this issue from the standpoint of God's truth, the, the standpoint of His Word. That means this, listen, the church is not different from the world in that we choose to ignore this issue. You know, we just, we just act like it isn't there. We just, we just act as if it doesn't exist. We just ignore it. No, the church is different in that we refuse to ignore it. We refuse to just say, well, live and let live. People are going to have their ways of thinking and all the rest. No, what we do is we take this issue and we bring it intentionally into the light, just like we bring everything else in our world into the light of God's Word, so that whatever is darkness has to be confessed as sin. Whatever is darkness has to be repented of. Whatever is darkness has to be aggressively put to death in our lives. We don't ignore it. We refuse to ignore it. We are different from the world in that we get our understanding of other people from our Creator. And because we've been saved 
delivered, brought into the light by our union with Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, now we find in ourselves the desire and the capacity to think about people from the vantage point of our Creator. I can say to you this way, as the world meets with the church, the world is to meet with a people who no longer think about other people the way we did before we knew Jesus. Can I just ask you, has your view of people changed since you came to know Jesus? It should have. It should have because once you were not only in darkness, you were darkness. But now you're light in the Lord, and you've been brought into the light. And so all these issues are brought into the light, and we see people in a way we did not and could not and didn't desire to before we knew Jesus. So we're different from the world in that we don't ignore it. We expose it. But we're also different from the world on the other end of the spectrum in that we don't obsess over it either. That is... Racial issues are not the driving force in the lives of believers. We don't turn these issues into an idol. And I warn you that in our world right now, that can be a great temptation. John Piper said this, he said, churches sometimes swing between the extremes of painful obliviousness to ethnic concerns and idolizing the topic as the only thing that matters. Frank Reed, senior pastor of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Baltimore, pointed out the dangers of making the issue of race into an idol. Here's what Pastor Reed said, quote, What the early Christians did not have to deal with to the same extent that we do today is how race has become an idol. On both sides of the racial divide, so much is twisted by the social constructs we formed and cling to about race. We've made a sport of pointing out racism when what we should be doing is focusing our prayers and actions toward creating congregations that proclaim Christ's lordship over his entire church. Close quote. And to that church we say what? Amen. 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 This is what makes the church different. The, the world meets with the people of Jesus Christ and meets with a people who no longer see others in the way that we did before we knew Jesus. What is it? Classification, categorization, relating based upon the classifications. Who's guilty of it or could, could be guilty of it? Anybody can. Everybody can. It's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. How's the church to be different? We don't ignore the issue. We bring it into the light. We don't obsess over the issue. It's not idolatry for us. We simply, like everything else in the world, want to listen to God on the issue. And then we're going to obey God on the issue. And wherever there's darkness, we repent of it. And we walk in the light. So how are we to think about it? But here's the first thing I want you to think about with me this morning. The doctrine of creation demonstrates that racial prejudice is a sin. Right? That, that categorization or that categorization, characterization, relating based upon the categories, you've got to be convinced that way of thinking about people is sinful. And the doctrine of creation proves that that way of thinking about people is sinful. In fact, I'll say it to you this way. Show me someone who carries racial prejudices in their mind and heart, and I'll show you someone who hasn't come to grips with the doctrine of creation. They either don't, they either don't know what the Bible teaches about creation, or they don't believe it. Because if we hear what the Bible says about creation and then we believe it with all of our hearts, it leaves no room for racial bigotry, no room for racial pride, no room for racial hatred. It is completely unacceptable, untenable if we believe what the Bible says about creation. You say, how? How does the doctrine of creation say that? Two ways. First of all, from the standpoint of the authority of the Creator. 
the authority of the Creator. We believe that all that exists was made by one true and living God. And he brought it all into existence just like he said he did in the book of Genesis. We believe the book of Genesis is inspired of God. We believe it is inerrant. There was only one person around when everything came into being. That was God. So if you want to know how it came into being, you listen to him. Now, if he made everything, then he knows everything about everything that he made. So if you want to know who people are, how they're to be thought about, how they're to be regarded, how they're to be related to, you listen to the one who made them. You listen to the one who created them. And what he tells us in his word is not only did he, did he make all of mankind from one man, one woman, but he tells us that all men are made in his image. All men have been made in his image. And that means that all mankind is to be equally regarded as possessing the same value and dignity that the Creator has assigned to this unique creation, man. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 says this, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. That was given by God at the time of Noah. So this is even before the Mosaic legislation. This, this is just a truth that God has given even before the law. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. For, because God made man in his own image. Such is the dignity of man assigned by the Creator that if one person takes another person's life, in a way that constitutes murder, the penalty for that is the death penalty. And notice in that verse there are no qualifications. Whoever sheds the blood of man, doesn't matter who you are, what your standing is in society, how much money you possess, what your name is, what your reputation is, if anyone sheds the blood of man, again, no qualifications, any man, any man, the price of that is your execution. Why? Because all men equally share in the dignity and the value that's been assigned by the Creator to this unique creation, man. Man has been made in the image of God. That's all men. All men. All mankind. Every man you look at. Every person you set your eyes on. It's true of them. Just as much as it's true of you. Just as much as it's true of you. But we can't stop there because the Creator has told us not only how we're to think about this as it relates to murder, He's told us how we're to think about this as it relates to how we think about people, how we feel about people, and what we say about people. James chapter 3, verse 7 says this, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse, listen, people, who are made in the likeness of God. It's plain in those verses, isn't it, that, that that's evil, evil. He talks about deadly poison. So when I look at another human being and I have evil thoughts in my heart toward them and I say evil things about them, what does it reveal? It reveals my sinfulness. And again, there are no qualifications in those verses. We're not free to curse a certain category of person, separated by categories of our own making. We're not free to hold pride and hatred and prejudice toward people and then express it in speech. He says it's evil. All of it's evil. And our Lord, is Jesus your Lord? Our Lord pointed out that God's judgment doesn't just extend to what we do with our hands, but also to what we hold in our hearts. 
This gets to how we think about others, how we feel about others. Matthew 5, 21, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. See, animosity toward people characterizes people who will be in hell. So Jesus talks about who we're angry against, who we would insult with our words. He says God's paying attention there as well. It's not just murdering someone with your hands. It's having hateful thoughts toward them in your heart, in your mind, that you then express with your words. The same is true in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19.18 said this, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Right? He says, I am Yahweh. I am God. And I'm telling you that you're not even to hold a grudge. You think this world bears evidence of grudges people are holding in their hearts based upon this particular subject. It's not to characterize Christian people. It's not to characterize God's people. And as Christ would go on to make plain in the parable of the Good Samaritan, my neighbor is anyone I come in contact with. When God's Word says, love your neighbor as yourself, hey, that's every human being. That's every human being. In fact, as a believer, I'm commanded to love my enemies. So even, even if I could somehow imagine that a particular group of people represent my enemies, which I can't, but if I could, even then, I would be commanded by God to love them as myself. I mean, if we just listen to the Creator, there's no room for this thing called racial bigotry, is there? If we just listen to our Creator, there's no room for racial pride, racial hatred, racial prejudice. It can't exist if we just listen to Him. And God made plain to His people under the Old Covenant that this wasn't just true, this kind of thinking is not just true when it came to their, to their ethnic brother, another Jewish person, Leviticus 19.34 says this, You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. And you shall love them as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And God keeps saying to them, doesn't he? Hey, I'm God. I'm telling you this is how you're to think about other people. So even the person who, who's not native to your land, who, who's a stranger, you love them like you love yourself. So from the standpoint of the authority of the Creator, if we just listen to His commandments, His pronouncements, His Word, there's no room for racial prejudice. But here's a second way that the doctrine of creation exposes this sin from the standpoint of the actions of the Creator. Not just His authority, not just his pronouncements, not just his word, but his actions, what he's actually done. I can say it to you this way, racial prejudice is not just insidious and sinful, it's illogical. It defies logic. It doesn't make a, a bit of sense if we believe the creation account. How does God explain the existence of ethnic, national, linguistic, biological differences between people? Sooner or later, parents, you know, today's Father's Day, your little child is going to ask you about that. Where did these different races come from? Where did these differences come from? Where did this all have its beginning? Well, how does the Bible answer that? How does the Bible answer 
the existence of ethnic, national, linguistic, biological distinctions between people. And I say to you that when we listen to what God says about that, it leaves no room for racial stereotypes or pride. How did all the nations and the races come to be? First of all, all people came from Adam and Eve. All people came from Adam and Eve. Genesis 1.26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him male and female. He created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Folks, that's where we all started. Right there. By the way, can I just say this? When you adopt an evolutionary view of the world, it leads to the kinds of ugly division that we see on our planet. You see, it is believing the doctrine of creation that shows how illogical it all is because we all, everyone in this room, came from the same father and mother. Who are my people? Well, I can tell you where you can trace it to, all the way to Adam and Eve. And who's excluded by that in this room? Who's distinguished by that understanding in this room? No one. We all trace our beginnings back to Adam and Eve, and that was the Creator's design. That's what He did. Now, that makes all racial division illogical. Romans 5.12 says this, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all, all men, because all sinned. And if you look at that in its context in Romans 5, when the Lord says they're all sinned, He means they all sinned in their federal head. They all sinned in Adam, because we all trace our origins to Adam. That's why God is able to say, one man, by one man, sin made its entrance into the world, and the death that is spread to all men can be traced to one man. How can that be true? Because that's how creation happened. So when you adopt an evolutionary point of view, you not only destroy the unity of the human race by virtue of its, of its natural origins, you also destroy the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of salvation. Because God's explanation for sin is it all came into being through one man's disobedience. That cannot be true unless you have a literal Adam and a literal Eve, and that's where it all began. So we all came from Adam and Eve. We all, if I, I could say it to you this way, we all share the same blood. All came from the same father and mother. But second, all people came from Noah and his family. Because the Bible tells us that God sent a great deluge of water upon this planet and he destroyed all humanity at one point in human history. He destroyed all humanity except for eight people. 1 Peter 3.20 says, Because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight Persons were brought safely through water. Eight people survived. Noah and his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives. That's it. Eight people. So if you're like me and you haven't gotten on the Mormon site <laughs> to trace all your heritage and you don't know where you, you know, I don't know beyond my grandparents where I came from. And frankly, I don't care. Because I know this, I can trace my heritage back to Noah and his family. And before that, I can trace my heritage to Adam and Eve. That makes it a lot simpler, doesn't it? Not to pay $30 a month or whatever it is to <laughs> figure it out. And then the Bible says that all people were dispersed when God confused the languages. Genesis 11, verse 1, now the whole earth had one language and the same words. This is after 
after the flood. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there, go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. People spread out all over the earth and you have different language groups and as a result different cultures that develop and all the rest. How did that come to be? Well, God did it. One man, one woman, Noah's family. Then in the book of Genesis chapter 11, the Lord disperses people and confuses languages. So that the biblical explanation for the nations is God. And, and this is stated clearly in Acts chapter 17, verse 24. You may want to jot that reference down. Keep that in mind as you talk to people about this issue. Acts 17, verse 24. The God, the God, the only God, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. What's Paul doing? He's declaring the unknown God to these people. Telling them who the true God is, what characterizes the true God. He doesn't live in a place built by men. He, he, he is sovereign over everything. Next statement, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So every human being on the face of the planet throughout all the ages of human history, we owe our life, our breath, our everything to this Creator. Next verse. And He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. He, God has God mapped out human history. The people, the places, the times. How do we explain the differences among us? God. The same God who says we're all made in His image. Which means we all possess the same dignity and value that He has assigned to this unique creation called man. He's the one who made us different. So here's what the doctrine of creation teaches us. The Creator tells us that He made man in His own image, that all men share in the dignity that belongs to that image equally, so much so that if any man sheds any man's blood, he's blood guilty, so much so that when any man curses men with his tongue, it's evil. He tells us we're to love our neighbor as ourself, whether friend or stranger or even enemy. He tells us that all men have descended from one man and that all men have their existence as they do, are made to appear to us as they do because of His sovereign providential work. Now I ask you, where in any of that doctrine would we find an explanation for racial divisions? Is there room for it there? Racial pride, racial bigotry, racial hatred. Is there room for it there, church? Is there? No. So how do you explain it? How do you explain it in this world? Answer? Sin. It's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. 
We explain it by man's darkened understanding. We explain it by man's sinful willingness to take differences, superficial differences, temporal differences, and then use those differences to exploit others and to exalt oneself. It's just sin. And it's not a sin confined to any one color of skin. It's a sin that has invaded and poisoned the whole human race. And as Christians, we have been delivered from it. We exist in the light. We now have the capacity and the desire to see men through the eyes of God. And tonight we'll come back and we'll see that it's not just the doctrine of creation that makes plain what this sin really is. It's also the doctrine of new creation. Are you as a Christian seeing other people through the eyes of the gospel? I want to finish with this though. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 5. We're done. Revelation chapter 5 because I want you to see this with your own eyes. Revelation 5 And look at verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you, worthy are you, Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Are you looking at this world through the prism of the blood of Jesus? Because he died to ransom for God, to, to bring forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God. He died to do this in a way that shows God's love for the whole world. All the tribes, all the peoples, all the nations, all the languages. So that for a Christian to say they understand, you know, one who says, I understand the death of Christ, to hold any view of people that doesn't express God's love for the whole world, is the grossest, most satanic kind of distortion I can imagine. How can you know that Jesus died for the world and not long to see all men saved and then long to love all saved men the same? Because these nations and peoples and tongues all will form a kingdom. And together we will reign on the earth. That's the grace of God. And that's a perspective of mankind that a lost and dying world that does not respect the Creator's authority nor believe His account of how it all came into being, that's not a way that the world is capable of thinking. But dear ones, that is absolutely the way the church must think. Tonight we'll come back and we'll see more. Let's pray. With your heads bowed before I pray, let me just ask you, do you know this Jesus who gave his life on the cross to ransom men for God from all the nations and all the peoples and all the tongues, all the languages? Do you know this Jesus? Perhaps the reason there may be someone sitting here this morning who has hatred in his or her heart for other, other people is because you don't know Jesus. May you today give your life to him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for the truth. Lord, we bring this subject into the light of the truth. And wherever there's darkness in us, wherever there's sin, wherever we have vestiges of this fallen way of thinking about other people, Lord, grant us great grace that we might put it to death in all of its forms and in that way agree with you. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.